Stefan and Christian, and we're talking about catching opportunities with open source software, but not only software. Um, you, you can tell this is kind of kind of keynotey thing. So shall we start? Um, I'd like to start with a small history lesson, um, just a very brief one. Uh, at the beginning of last century, um, there, there was the following situation in, in Europe. Uh, there was England, who was pretty much leading the industrial um, uh, development at that time, and there was Germany pretty much lagging behind. And at one point, England introduced a copyright law which prohibited you to copy books. So books became pretty much expensive, could only be afforded by rich people, and rich people, as you know, don't have the urge to develop anything or to, to uh, invent anything. In Germany, we had no copyright law at that time, and uh, what happened with books over in Germany was that books got copied all the time. So when a publisher put out a book, um, the book would reappear in several other publications with the same title and spread really, really fast over the land. Um, and the effect was that many, many people had access to knowledge, so about agriculture, about industrialization and stuff. Um, so. Instead of the copyright law, we had a fast-moving uh, knowledge transfer from, from uh, people to people. And this is actually the essence of open source as we see it. It's the transfer of knowledge. Um, yeah, free software is therefore free as in speech, not as in beer. So it's not something that you give away um, just to make somebody happy. It's, it's actually uh, teaching other people. Um, you, you speak to them. It's a dialogue uh, when, you do, when you do open source. You, you communicate to other people. You teach them things. Uh, you show them how things are done. You might also tell them that you have a problem or uh, raise questions over this. So how, how do you actually use open source? Why, um, why is open source actually useful to you? Um, well, the thing is... Um, for you as an individual, open source can be like your CV, like your resume. Um, it will tell something about the work that you've done, the skills that you have, things like that. Um, at some point, a couple of years ago, um, I, I was leaving the company that I was working for at that point, and, um, well, being myself, and I tweet way too much, but I put out on Twitter, like, okay, guys, I'm, I'm open for a new challenge. Uh, does anyone have a job for me? And within a week, I had 10 job interviews. So this is, the, because people knew me from the, from the open source community, from the PHP community, from the Symfony community, people would know, okay, I, we know this guy, we know what he does, we know the work that he does. We can actually check his code, because the code that he puts out is open source. We can see that he has the skills. And within a week, I had 10 job interviews, and I was able to pick the right job from this list of jobs, which was, which was quite interesting. And, and these days, there are actually quite a few sites out there that will help you in uh, showing off the stuff that you do. Aside, of, of course, from open sourcing your stuff on, on GitHub or SourceForge, there are sites like Mojo Live, um, Olo, Geeklist, LinkedIn, where you can actually list the stuff that you've done and show people, uh, you know, this is what I can do. Um, uh, this is the stuff that I've, I've been doing for the past years. Just check it, and then you will want, will want to offer me a job, basically. Yeah, the... the so that, that was one example. So Stefan got a job interviews um, not only because he's a great guy, but because he was known for something. And uh, this reputation level is something that you can easily achieve. I'm not as active in, in any of these communities that Stefan is, um, but still, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a blogger, so uh, people read my stuff, and uh, I got pretty known. And it helped me in my job, actually, because I was, uh, for, for a long time, consulting development teams um, all over Europe um, that belonged to our company. And it was really easy to go to a new team that didn't know me um, personally, but they kind of accepted that I knew something, that I had to share something, just by being, or my, my, my blog being known to them. 
So that was a kind of uh, nice entry uh, to, to new challenges. Um, but uh, contributing to open source um, is, I, I think, the, one of the most um, important aspects is to provoke feedback. Um, so what, what you're doing when you do something open source is actually you, you lean yourself out there. You, um, you do a one-to-many communication thing. You say, hello, I'm here, I've got something to share, whether it's code or knowledge or a question or anything, and uh, there will be feedback for you. So people will react on what you share. They will um, say, that's a cool code that you have there, cool tool, new feature, I like that. Um, you could probably change something here or there. They will answer your question. Um, they, they will uh, just thank you for, for sharing um, a solution for a problem that they just experienced. Um, so this frequently happens to me on the blog. Um, so, so far for the last two and a half years, I have something like 500 something posts, um, and I have something like 3,000 something comments on that. Um, and, and these comments have been really valuable. Uh, so I often blog about things uh, that I, I don't have the solution for, I just have a problem. Um, and once in a while there will be somebody with the same problem and a solution. So it's a bit like, um, you can do that on Stack Exchange or, or wherever, um, or on a mailing list, um, but getting this feedback will actually speed you up in your developments um, and it will make whatever you're working on better. Right. Uh, we're still here. Oh, we're still here. <laughs> so I, uh, I have another story about this. Um, uh, back in the days when I was just starting out with PHP, I, uh, this was in the time of PHP 3, I think, um, one of the first things, one of the first problems I needed to solve was I had a website and I wanted to send out newsletters. So I, I created this newsletter software that would be able to send out new newsletters to anyone that subscribed. Um, and I decided to put it up on SourceForge, open source it. So I put it up, and within two days, I got an email from someone that said, you know, there is a security bug in your software. Um, so it, it, was, uh, it allowed me to improve my software, the stuff that I'm using myself as well. I open sourced it, it allowed me to, to improve on that and to fix that security bug so that at least people would not be able to send spam using this software. So this is a very nice way of, of getting some feedback, improving the software. Another, another um, interesting story is the Link Tuesday story. So Link Tuesday um, is, is we, I have a website, linktuesday.com. Um, which I started because there is this thing going on on Twitter in the PHP community um, on Tuesday. You share a link that is interesting to other developers and you use the hashtag link Tuesday. But keeping track of that on Twitter is really annoying. So I just built a simple website that would search Twitter and would list all of the new links every Tuesday. And I open sourced it and within a couple of days I got some pull requests on GitHub for new features, stuff that I had not built, and someone else was like, okay, I, we need this. And, and they just built it, and they sent me a pull request. So it was like I got free work, basically. Uh, so this is the great thing about open source, is uh, people will contribute, and they don't want anything back, they just want to improve on the software. Right. And there's another reason for doing uh, open source stuff, uh, which is fame and glory. It's it's not, nothing is wrong about bragging about what you know and what you can do. Um, as, you, as you go along, you will improve by the feedback you will get, but it's really nice to be known to people. So if you enter a conference and there's at least two, three, four people that know what you're doing and they just say hi to you, that's, that's an amazing feeling, actually. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so I can only recommend, if you, if you know somebody from a blog or from, from a, uh, GitHub or from anywhere, from Twitter, uh, approach them, say hi. I think most of the people doing open source appreciate that. Um, I mean, in the end, we're all divas. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, but the most important question probably is, um, so far we have been talking about contributing to open source as an individual. So that's uh, all based in your free time. But why should businesses contribute to open source as well? Um, and, and this is the, the part that we like to, to shed some focus on um, because it's, we, I think we have some arguments why you should actually convince um, your, your employer uh, to do open source in some way. 
Yeah, and, and convincing employers or companies in general is quite hard because a lot of companies say, so why should we give away the software that we've spent so much time and money on building this? Well, there's a lot of good examples on success stories where companies got a lot of success. Um, think about improving your own business. Think about, um, uh, for instance, agencies, a web agency uh, like, like Sensio. Um, they built this internal framework for their own projects, and then at some point they decided to open source it. And um, well, that's what Symphony is now. And if you look at Symphony now, there is a complete ecosystem around Symphony. Um, and, and Sensio has moved from being just another web agency to a leading company worldwide for PHP. So this is what open sourcing your software can do for you. Um, you turn from just another company to, to a worldwide um, important company for software in general. Actually, speaking of Symfony, um, as far as I know, there are over 100 contributors to the Symfony code, all not paid by, by Sensio, or most of them. Um, so that's free work you can get um, by, by just putting out a cool new product. Um, no, we're not there yet. We're not there yet. No. Well, <laughs> <laughs> well actually, um, some, some other examples um, of, of improving businesses um, is sometimes software comes out as a byproduct. So uh, you, you want to achieve something, and uh, when you do, you, you produce some software. And there are companies that don't sell software or coding, um, like, for example, the BBC. Um, and the BBC does television. You all know that. They do radio stuff, they do television, and, and probably a lot more. They also produce software. Uh, because sometimes they have problems in distributing their information, their broadcasts, and uh, they just need solutions for that. So they program it or, or yeah, um, they produce software. And, and this software is of no use to them other for solving the problem. So they thought, let's put it out there, let's open source it. Um, so if, you, if you're looking for uh, the BBC and uh, open source on Google, you will find a huge library of add-ons to Apache and all kinds of stuff, um, video encoding and whatever. As even, there was even a, a JavaScript library that they used to run. Um, and another example would have been, um, well, Google itself. Um, you, know, you all know that there's Google Code, and there's, there's also a lot of APIs uh, open to the public. <coughs> some some uh, tools that access these APIs are open source, uh, like accessing the Google Maps API. So there are libraries for that. And it actually helps them to extend their business. Um, there's also... Uh, well, there's, there's also an example of how not to do it um, that I'd like to share, which is Amazon's um, Kindle Fire, uh, because they kind of took uh, an operating system, Android, which is open source, um, pretty much, and they changed it so that they could fit it into their business model, and now they have a closed source Android-ish operating system um, that they have to maintain fully by themselves. And uh, if you look at the figures right now, how many iPad, uh, how many uh, Kindles, uh, Kindle Fires are, are being sold, uh, you will see that's a huge decline from, from its start, um, which to me comes down to it's, it's not attractive anymore because it's still running on a kind of fucked up gingerbread version while everybody of us is enjoying an ice cream sandwich and is hoping for the next version to be even more colorful. So they took something open source, closed it down, and are miserable about it, I yeah. think. Actually, um, um, an, an interesting story, uh, coming back to the BBC, right. um, is I, I, right now I work, uh, I do a project for Dutch public broadcasting, and they do a very similar thing there, because they don't want to maintain their own versions of uh, Apache and things like that. So any time they fix a bug or any time they need a new feature, they will open source or contribute it back to Apache, send in a patch, so that they can just update to uh, upgrade to the next version when it comes out instead of having to patch it manually and then pu uh, putting it on their servers. So that's an interesting story yeah, around that. Because most arguments your employer has for not doing open source, it's, it's additional work that, that doesn't... <coughs> 
um, provided a direct benefit. Um, and uh, we're giving away um, our knowledge and our competitors might use it. And uh, for each piece of code, you have to ask yourself, is this really a unique selling point for our business? Is our business really depending on that? Um, I mean, I work for a publisher, and uh, we, we do content. We do content websites. Of course, we have to program a lot. Um, but sharing this code uh, doesn't, doesn't ruin our business model, because the business model is still the content side. So uh, that there's actually no risk of giving away anything. Right. So that's about contributing. Of course, you can build stuff on top of open source as well. And this is where I can share my, my, the story of my own company. I, I run my own company, and I do uh, a software development, and I do consulting and things like that. Um, um, and I, I use open source for most of the stuff I build uh, because, well, it's there already. Why should I reinvent the wheel when someone else built this awesome framework that I can use to build my stuff on top of? And obviously, when I run into an issue um, that I can fix, then I, it, it's like five minutes' work, especially now with GitHub. It's five minutes' work to actually contribute that fix back into uh, the open source project. So there is really no reason to not contribute anymore um, as a developer or even as a company. Uh, plus, of course, you get the benefits of your company name being sort of associated with that product, uh, project. So, uh, yeah, I, when I start a new project, the first thing I do is look for the right open source software that I can build this project on top of. And sometimes that's just PHP, and other times that will be Symfony or Zen Framework. Um, and then I can use this reputation because I contributed to open source by blogging, by um, uh, contributing code, stuff like that. And I can use this, this um, uh, reputation that I built um, by doing that in selling projects to new customers. Um, I get calls about every week, people finding me just Googling around, finding my name on the internet associated with, I don't know, Symfony or Zen Framework. And they have a project in Symfony or Zen Framework, and they need some, someone to work on that. So I, I get most of my, I, I don't really have to do any sales because I get most of my work through that way, people finding me instead of me having to find my next customer. So that's quite amazing. Um, as a business owner, at, at least for me, I like that. True. <laughs> um, and there has to be some, something said about uh, warranty. Um, I think all major open source licenses say that it comes without warranty. Um, so it's not guaranteed to work for you, it's not guaranteed to be stable, it's not guaranteed to be um, develop any further, uh, there's no guarantee for bug fixes or for support or anything. So that's all down in the, in the license. Um, still, many developers think that when I put something out there, I am responsible for that in that I have to do the maintenance. So if somebody comes along and says there's a bug here and I have a problem there, I have to answer back. Um, and that takes a lot of time. And because it takes a lot of time, I don't really want to do it. So I keep it for myself. So you miss out on all the positive side, sides that we mentioned. Um, but it's not true. You don't have to answer back. I mean, it's nice for you to answer back, and you should really, but you don't have to maintain your own software. Um, you, you don't have to fix bugs. Because it, it happened to me quite often. So I developed a, a bunch of uh, Symphony 1 plugins um, like two years ago, three years ago. And um, I still get questions nowadays telling me that the plugin is really cool and it's working for me, but I have this little uh, special problem uh, that it doesn't solve, and, or I found a bug here. Uh, could you please fix that? And the answer has to be no, can't, because I'm, not, I'm no longer running Symphony 1 anywhere, so I have no way of, of proving or, or finding the bug, fixing it, uh, or even reproducing it. Um, but I can answer back, no, I can't do it, but here's the GitHub link, so fork it yourself. I will be happily pulling your pull, uh, uh, accepting your pull request. Um, or I give the maintenance away to somebody else, so I make you an admin of that repository, and from now on, the official repository is with you. That's totally fine. Things deprecate. 
um, and you move on as well. So uh, nobody, just because you open source something, it doesn't mean that you're responsible for it for the next 100 years. And this is actually in, in, the, in the Symphony 1 a plugin database, there is this checkbox that you can mark to tell people that your plugin has been deprecated, is no longer maintained. So it's very clear, very easy to just tell people, you know, the plugin might work for you, but I'm not actually maintaining it anymore, so I'm not fixing any bugs. An interesting thing about this as well um, um, is an, an interesting example is the Cassandra project. Cassandra is a, is a big, big data database, and um, it was started by Facebook. They started developing the whole thing but then they really didn't want to spend the time on maintaining it. And uh, now it actually became an Apache project. So it's actually the Apache community is working on maintaining Cassandra. Uh, so this is what can happen as well. And this is what Christian was mentioning. You can, actually, you can actually just put it out there and other people might pick it up and maintain the software for you. All right. So it's not just about open source. Um, are not just about code. It's also about data. Um, you can open up your data and then have a lot of benefit from that. Interesting example for that is how many people here use Foursquare? I see a couple of hands. How many people used Gowalla? No hands. That's what I meant. So Foursquare, they opened up their data. Basically, what they're saying is we're a, I don't know, location database. And you can connect to our API and build anything on top of it. And I don't know, charge money for it. We don't care. Um, Goala didn't do that. Goala basically did the same thing as Foursquare, but it looked really fancy. Uh, but they didn't really open it up. So now Goala is dead. Foursquare is, well, everyone uses, well, not everyone, but a lot of people use Foursquare, and you can build on top of their API to create, like, a very interesting apps that are sort of location-based. So this is a great uh, example of opening up your data, and you should be, you might be, as a publisher, you probably don't want to open up everything, but if you're closing down everything, then people will find a way around that anyway. Exactly. Um, another example would be Facebook itself. Um, Facebook opened up their, their uh, Graph API uh, and all their data, or most of it, um, to other applications. So it's easy for everybody to just write down an application, whether it's a game or a calendar or whatever you want to do. Um, and I assume that Facebook wouldn't be as successful as it is if there wouldn't have been um, the possibility to create apps. So there are thousands, if not millions, of apps that people use every day and which are probably the main attraction of the whole platform. Um, on the other side, you have Google+, Plus, which has a major buzz when it came out, and uh, a lot of companies wanted to jump on the train and, and to make a successful business model with that, but they found that they couldn't really do anything. They could create a page and uh, provide some messages, and that's almost it except for the gaming industry, maybe. Um, so it's not as successful because it's not as sexy. And it's not possible for a company doing a social network um, to, to provide the same amount of functionalities and entertainment as Facebook on their own. Facebook employs millions of developers worldwide without paying them, just by opening up their data. Yeah, and, and, and another example would be OpenStreetMap. Um, Everyone knows Google Maps, and, and a lot of people will use Google Maps. But they, they are, so you can use their API, but the data is in there, and you're not getting the raw data. Whereas for OpenStreetMaps, um, uh, the data is out there. You can actually get all of the data out of their database and use it to, to do anything. With Google, you have to use their color scheme, and you have to use their API, and things like that, where for OpenStreetMap, you can actually run your own tile server, create your own color schemes, things like that. And if you look now, uh, some of the major um, iPhone apps, including Apple's apps themselves, are now using OpenStreetMap instead of Google Maps. Because you can customize, because you can do your own stuff with it, and, and that's, that's the beauty of, of opening up your data. Um, maybe um, how to be successful for open source projects is also a, um, an important question. 
the first thing you have to remind yourself of is that most, the, the, the most part of open source projects are dying. They have no interest um, generated in, 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 or any audience generated. So uh, many things are on GitHub that are not used by anyone but whoever put it on there. Yeah. Um, but there are <laughs> ways uh, to be successful. Oh. Um, a good example of that would be dot blocks. Um, anyone here use PHP Documenter? Yes, I see some hands. So PHP Documenter was the standard uh, documentation, API documentation generator in the PHP world. But at some point, um, they stopped maintaining PHP Documenter at all. So this was sort of annoying to a lot of people, but nobody did anything about it until Mike Van Riel um, started the DocBlocks project. And the DocBlocks project is all about creating a new generation um, a documentation generator. And he built it, and it, it quickly became successful because there was, uh, um, there was nothing else doing that same thing. Um, so if you start a project um, uh, and you want to open source it, think about, okay, what, what market am, am I looking at here? Are there a lot of people that are trying to solve this problem by themselves? And if you look now, uh, DocBlocks actually was renamed into PHP Documenter, and now it's, it, it's called PHP Documenter again, and this is the standard software that everyone uses. And actually, um, uh, Fabian open-sourced the, the documentation generator he used for Symfony with the only real purpose being that uh, PHP Documenter could look at the code, could get the good stuff out of it, and then perhaps in the future, Symfony could actually adopt PHP Documenter instead of using this custom-built uh, open-source software. Um, so, yeah, this is how you can create a successful project, by finding uh, the right market, finding the right, uh, or solving the right problem, basically. Yeah, I think solving the right problem is, is um, the first thing you should actually focus on. You should ask yourself, is what you are about to open source, is it of use to anyone but yourself? Uh, so is it really a special problem that only you have and only you will have, or is it something that is uh, solving a, mo a more common problem that will probably um, be useful for, for more people than just yourself? Um, because to be successful in open source, you need to reach an audience. You need to get feedback. You have to generate an interest in what you're doing. And, and this can only be done if you share the same problem to start with. Um, what you don't have to care about too much is the quality of your code. Um, there can be flaws in there. There can be bugs in there. It's all fine. It doesn't have to be perfect. That's what open source is all about. It will improve through the feedback you will get. Well, that's my part. <laughs> um, yeah, and another thing um, that, that's really important to remember is uh, that <coughs> if you put yourself out there, you're not alone. Um, I, I know it, it feels kind of weird if you start a blog, if you, if you start uh, putting out open source software somewhere. Um, you, you think that who, who the hell might be interested in what I'm doing? I'm, I'm totally alone. And uh, because you're kind of used to that, you get your problems um, every day and you find solution for that. And you may have your coworkers and colleagues that you, that you relate to, but you don't get any, any broader feedback than that. As soon as you uh, lean yourself out there by doing anything open source or contributing to a community, um, you will get feedback and you will see that you're not the only one. You're not the dumbest person on earth. Um, everybody is as, as stupid as you are. Everybody is as clever as you are. Um, so, so it feels really good to be part of that. Yeah, and actually, um, I'm not the best developer in the world. Um, so putting my stuff out there can actually help me get some feedback from people that are actually way better than myself. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the newsletter thing, I put it out there and I could fix a security issue within days. So that's really useful. So now let's look at how you can actually join the community, how you can actually contribute back into the open source world. Um, obviously, there are a lot of ways of doing that. Um, if, if you work with open source software, if you use a project on a regular basis, then there's probably a mailing list for that software. So it is really easy to just subscribe to the mailing list and keep 
checking there and, and ask questions. Asking questions is actually contributing to open source because there will be other people having the same question and there will be an answer to that question on the mailing list and the mailing list is public. So other people will actually see the answer as well and it will help them solve their problem as well. And obviously if you can answer a question, this is a great contribution as well because that will help solve other people their problems as well. So using that, doing that on mailing lists is very, uh, yeah, very good thing. Um, it's very similar for IRC. Um, so IRC is still not dead. It's really alive, especially in the open source world. A lot of people using IRC. There's a lot of channels on, for instance, the Freenode network for, for open source projects where you can hang out and you can ask questions similar to on the mailing list. The only thing is that the response is usually faster. Obviously not always because, well, people have to work every once in a while. But yeah, people hang out in the channel and will monitor the channel and if they can answer your question, then they will. And it's the same for you. If you know the answer to a question, just take two minutes of your time to answer the question. And both on mailing lists and IRC, this will help you improve your reputation within that project, within the community for that project. Because now the next time you have a question, someone will remember, right, that's the guy that solved the is this issue for me. Maybe I can take some time now to help him solve that issue. And another thing that you can do um, to contribute to the open source communities um, around the world is uh, starting a blog or commenting on a blog. Um, I started my blog like a couple of years ago um, to teach myself how to do test-driven development because I found that while working it wasn't really possible for me to, to kind of introduce this new working scheme um, while fixing problems. Uh, so I started this blog as a kind of self-discipline thing of teaching myself or forcing myself to, um, to touch the topic every single day just to remind myself. And uh, at the time I was working with Symphony 1 and Symphony 1 and unit testing for example doesn't really go well together. Um, so I stumbled about a lot of problems that I blogged about. I found a few small solutions but I found way more problems. Um, and what it, tur it turned out that I wasn't the only one thinking about unit testing and doing it on Symfony, so I provoked a lot of feedback. Um, so I got a lot of comments on that and, and slowly over time I became quite, quite confident in the topic of, of unit testing uh, together with Symfony 1 and uh, also in general um, just by interacting with people who had the same problems or who were one step further than I was at the time. So I learned a lot through that. Um, and you probably will have seen it uh, yourself if you're, if you're not writing a blog, if you're, if you're looking for an answer to a problem that you face. Um, there is a good chance that you will find the, the answer on some blog somewhere on the internet. Um, if the blog post that you're looking at is raising the same question as, as you have, um, it's only fair to share if you have an answer uh, to comment there. Um, if, it, if it raises or if it provides an answer to your, to your problem, um, it's only fair to, to leave a comment saying thank you uh, because this is actually encouraging most of, of the bloggers. <coughs> bloggers do it for fame and glory. They lean they, themselves out there. They want to be, you, you know, they want to get positive feedback. So saying thank you will keep up blogs in the internet. Yeah, there's actually an interesting story when I worked, sorry, <coughs> when I worked for a company a couple of years ago and they had a company blog and um, one of my colleagues, they uh, actually, she actually posted uh, a blog post about, I think it was um, a Zen Paginator or something like that, how she solved a specific problem using Zen Paginator and she got a comment in about five minutes after she posted the blog. Um, saying, well, you solved it like that, but you could actually solve it like this and it would be better. So in, even a simple comment like that will improve the software as well that you're building. Um, and so instead of um, being scared because you know you posted something and it was actually not the best solution, you should be happy about that because you get the feedback and you can improve on that. Um, another uh, form of <coughs> contributing without actually putting your, your own software out there is, uh, of course, on GitHub, it's pull request. Um, there are 
different levels of pull requests out there. So you have like code contributions, whole new features, bug fixes, uh, but you also have pull requests that, that just um, put the formatting of your code right, uh, that add, introduce some comments to your code, uh, that change um, a typo in the documentation, all that kind of stuff. Um, it seems little, but it will improve what you're doing a lot. So uh, I can only recommend to A, look at pull requests that you get, and B, do pull requests. So if you see a typo somewhere, if you see something that is odd to you, if you find a bug, um, and you have to find a solution anywhere for that because you need it to work. Um, just send a pull request and contribute back. Yeah, most of my pull requests are actually not code. It's it's mostly documentation and, and stuff like that, which I guess you want to talk about. Yep. Um, <laughs> actually, in the in the in the Symphony um, community, when Symphony two started, uh, Symphony two started in code only. Uh, there wasn't much documentation. There were a lot of rumors and uh, problem solving stuff going on on the blog level. Uh, but the documentation was pretty much uh, left behind during the whole development thing. And uh, then at some point, I don't know where he came from, uh, there was a guy called uh, Ryan Weaver um, who just said, oh, this is all rubbish. I do the documentation from now on. And he's still doing it, not by himself, but he's kind of organizing it. And uh, he wrote pages, hundreds of pages of documentation. Whenever he found a problem, whenever he, 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 he realized how some things are working, he wrote a documentation page about it. Um, so he liked, obviously, to write documentation. Um, these people exist. <laughs> so, and if you can attract one, um, these are the most uh, valuable um, pull request I can I can imagine. Yeah, and another way of contributing, obviously, is by speaking at user group meetings or at conferences, because then you share your knowledge about whatever you work on on a daily basis with a lot of people that don't know about it yet, and they want to learn about it. That's why they come to a conference, uh, or maybe for the wine and the beer as well. But. Um, Speaking at a user group meeting or at a conference is a great way of sharing your knowledge, the stuff that you found out the hard way, with people that need to find out about it as well. And they can learn from, from your mistakes and, and also, of course, from the stuff that you did right. So, and, and of course, and, and this is another benefit of, of being part of the open source community. If you speak at a conference, you get to go to from like the Paris, for instance. Well, you guys are from Paris, probably. But you can go anywhere. There's conferences worldwide. And if you get accepted, usually they will cover your flight and your hotel. And you, they will take you out for dinner and wine and a lot of wine, <laughs> like last night. Um, but it, I mean, this is this is a, a benefit for people like you guys trying to learn about new stuff, and pe for people like me as a speaker going everywhere. And and also um, speaking at conferences <coughs> is also improving what you already know. Um, because once you, you basically start with an idea of a topic that you that you're generally working on, and uh, you you bring it into a call of paper, and this is some abstract uh, description of what you want to explain, um, and if you get accepted, you have a lot of work in front of you because you then have to bring it into shape. You, you have to be clear about what you already know and all the things that you had in your head have to be there on the slides and have to be uh, communicated to the audience. And afterwards, you will get so much better in, in your topic. You will have a far better understanding of your topic than, than just by doing it um, you know, from the guts. Yeah. So. Yeah, that's. I, I guess the last point is yours. Right. Um, we have a minute. We have a minute, all right. Um, well, the last point would be, uh, I, I said it before, you don't have to be perfect. Um, so if you look at all the question and answers platforms out there, I know it's the most annoying thing to find the exact same question that you have, but no answers for that. You're looking for answers if, if you're Googling, not for questions. Um, but. You have to remember that to, to produce an answer, somebody has to raise the question first. Um, and this should be you, every one of you. This should be me and Stefan. Uh, so whenever you, you stumble upon a problem, you have a question, raise it somewhere, on a blog, on a, on a platform, on a mailing list, on, on IRC, wherever. Um, only this way an answer can be provoked. Yeah, just don't be 
don't be afraid of doing that. Don't be afraid of making a fool of yourself because you won't. Asking the question is the best thing that you can do. Yeah. Also, um, probably if, if you are part of a community and, and you are answering back to those questions, um, you should also remind yourself that these questions are valuable and your answer should be at least polite and helpful. And uh, you, know, you know, there are some mailing lists that, that bash new buys. Um, don't do that. You started like them as well. Yeah, so the first thing you can do to contribute back to the community is by rating our talk on JoinedIn, giving us some feedback. Um, this is the URL. Um, because as a speaker, it is very invaluable to get feedback from, from people at the conference. Um, not just the good parts, but also the stuff that can be improved. So the next time we do this talk, we can improve it even more over what we did today. Not just for our talk, by the way. Do it for every talk at this conference. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Any questions? Yeah, micro, let's see. <laughs> um, right, so you've talked a lot about um, getting into the community, erasing your profile, and being out there and being known. Um, what I was thinking, not that I kind of find myself in this kind of a situation, but as well as you being perceived, perceived um, with a good feedback, and uh, and everybody recognize you in the in the in the good ways, what would you do, or, or what would you advise to somebody that got some kind of a black PR because of some stuff that he did badly? I know it might be a difficult question. Um, actually, it, it isn't, I think, um, because you, you know we are all full of flaws, um, and, and our friends probably not telling us the whole truth. Um, so, but if, if you're out there um, in, on the internet, uh, people don't know you personally, so they have no boundaries on getting feedback. So you will get negative feedback as well. Some of it is just bashing. Some of it could be constructive if you use it well, if you improve on, the, on these points. If you were so badly wrong um, that, that you think your reputation is, is really suffering from it, um, you should especially look at the point, improve yourself, and communicate that you improved and how you improved and to what. That's the only way. If, if you communicated yourself out there and, and uh, got a bad reputation, uh, the same principles go to, to get it back, to get a good one back. There was, um, last October, there was a month where a Dutch uh, magazine posted a security problem with big websites in the Netherlands every day. And most of the responses from the, the guys that built the software was like, there's no problem, there's no problem, because they fixed it quickly, of things like that. Um, there was actually one company, I mean, this was probably the biggest hack, that they got like 15 million personal uh, personal data records and stuff like that. Huge hack. And this, the company basically said, yeah, there was an issue. We solved it, and this is how we solved it. This is the best way to do it. So you, you get a bit of an issue, obviously, with your reputation because this was a huge security risk. Um, but then you just communicate. So, okay, there was a problem. We did this to improve. We did this to fix it, and this is how we solved the problem. And then, actually you turn around the negative uh, uh, communication into positive communication. Yeah. Actually, de denial isn't adding to your reputation yeah. at all. <laughs> <laughs> so any more questions? Hello. Uh, do you think, uh, for instance, uh, when you're developing an API, it should be something nice to get the developers involved that not working with you on the project? It usually is because you gain a lot of knowledge that you don't have yourself. Um, people are experienced in these kind of things. Um, 
So probably the design of your API will improve. Um, and also you will make it known with people that are going to use it, that you intend them to use it. So uh, yeah, getting out there um, on the planning phase, describing what you want to achieve, how you want to achieve it, the problem doesn't have to be ready at that point, but the idea has to be clear. And you will probably be faster in development and you will get your, your first user base before you even have a product. Any more questions? Anyone else? Okay, thank you. Thanks a lot.